Hello and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Oh, look, it's oh, Nikki. Hello. Welcome. Hello, Pete Wright. Hi. Hi, Nikki. Uh, we are, this is Tech Techvember. Techvember. As coined by Discord mom, Melissa. And uh, I have to say before we start, like the whole idea, I think it was it Melissa's idea. Yes. This whole Tech Vember thing. I think it was Melissa's entire yes. idea. And as such, this is the shout out I want to give to Melissa. Melissa is the kind of person who had this idea for Tech Vember and then did all the work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, talk about putting your money where your mouth is. Like, Melissa did a ton of work. The whole concept is that we use November to go back through our history of tech episodes Which that we've done. Which is not like, We did that history. for a long it's time. A pretty big it's history. not a small yeah. history. <laughs> we did these digital, for a while, we did digital episodes about once a month, of the show. Yeah. And, yeah, about once a month we'd do a digital episode, and we would uh, we would talk about apps and things we're using, and tools and technologies around a certain certain you know con conceit, I guess you know health, healing, email, work, whatever. And she started going back through the list and realized like, there are a lot of apps that some are still around and doing very well. Some of them are just discontinued, and we have them living in our podcast history. So if somebody goes back to episode one thirty eight, uh, they might find that we recommend things highly in some cases that do not exist right. anymore. So rather than going back through and actually deleting all those things, we thought we would do a couple of episodes of Tech Update. So, it, you know, please stick around for November. This is episode, technically episode two. We did our whole email thing last week and we're gonna, we're gonna continue our march to the sea. Uh, as I we uh, continue talking about tech. Me too. I'm very excited about that. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. Get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list and we will send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD. But to really connect with us, join us in the ADHD Discord community. It's super easy to jump into the general community chat channel. Just visit TakeControlADHD.com slash discord you will be whisked over to the general invitation and log in if you're looking for more of course you can become a patron by way of patreon patreon is listener supported podcasting with a few bucks a month you can help guarantee that we continue to grow the show add new features and invest more heavily in our community and you get a lot of discord secret channels there's that's where the real conversation is happening it is our entire back channel for uh for communicating with members and we absolutely love it uh and in the in the you know right now it's kind of nice to have a protected space yes because having public conversations on certain other social media networks have gotten kind of dark yes. so uh it's really nice to have this protected space mm -hmm. to have these conversations so we really really love it so much great support. So patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. Do we have any news? Uh, let's see. Do we have news? Yes, we do have news. <laughs> um, kind of going off the fly here. Uh, but I'm going to plant a little seed. Just a little seed. Okay. Uh, okay. GPS, which is the membership mm -hmm. program that I offer at TCA, is a planning. Uh, it's all around planning and scheduling and task management and how to use your calendar. It's a wonderful right. program. Absolutely love it. Believe in it 100%. And uh, we are going to be opening up enrollment soon for the next cohort of people to join us in January. But that's all I'm going to say right now. Oh, so oh. I'm just going to plant the seed. That is a so, tease. That's a nice yeah. seed. So if people are, are interested in GPS, you know, check it out because you might see an yeah. open enrollment here pretty soon. Well, if we know anything, it's that January is going to come up real, that's, real fast. That's right. So well, and the seed is planted. is planted. It's good and to start thinking about it. I'm glad you asked me that question because I looked at the, the calendar and said, oh, it's November 15th. I should probably plant that seed. Yeah. It's planted. That's right. Seed. Seed planted. <laughs> All right. Let's get All nerdy. All right. Let's do it. Nikki, last week we did uh, almost an hour of a conversation about email. Do you have, I mean, has that stuck yes. with you at all? Did you end up making any not changes only, to your the way you live yes, with email? Not only has it stuck with me, but I have referred the podcast <laughs> to several people to go listen to. <laughs> uh, yes, it actually was so helpful. And uh, 
And I think, you know, one of the biggest things that that I took away and I hope other people take away is that it's okay to archive. It's okay. Yeah. Just get it out. Get it out. Don't worry about, you know, anything right now. Just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how freeing yes. it is when you just yes. swipe to archive or, or just move it to archive. It's yeah. really, really yeah. great. I, I'm so glad. Uh, we have just a little bit of follow up, you know, we, and we should put in the show notes because um, I, I had. I need to jump in and make sure I'm attributing this right. But we had a we posted in episode 214, uh, downtime and finding a recharge with ADHD. Uh, we posted Suzanne, uh, community member Suzanne, posted a an email to us, the power of filters in Gmail, and we just reposted that email in its entirety. We talked about some of these things in our um, in our email episode, but I think uh, Suzanne's message, actually, it still holds up using filters and how to use filters to, uh, you know, based on search results is super, super easy right in Gmail and, and um, you know, allows you to essentially create uh, sorted filters that you can then uh, access in all your other email clients, if you're even if you're not using Gmail on the web. So I uh, I think it's really really useful. So that is in episode two fourteen. Thank you again. Now it's been nay years. When did that come in? That that I mean this episode was from uh, well a long time ago. Episode two fourteen, yeah. probably five years ago, and it's it still holds up. That's so good. thanks, um, thank you, still Suzanne. Uh, this was uh, in episode 324. We did uh, email is not precious and other stress relieving axioms to save you time. Mm -hmm. That was our, our episode 324. We talked about four email apps in that episode. One was Gmail. We talked about Gmail. And I think Gmail, in terms of an update, they're continuing to try to make the Gmail web app more useful for more people to do more things. Like, for example, the latest feature that, that is coming, if not completely integrated by the time you hear this, is package tracking in Gmail. So when somebody sends you uh, a, an email that has a packing number in it, like a tracking number in it, you can then track without having to leave Gmail. It'll just give you the interface that says, here's where your package is. It's, uh, oh, it's in uh, Bozeman now and trucking its way across mm -hmm. Montana. So uh, that's uh, that's one of those things that's really useful. And it's, it's an, uh, a, a continued investment by Google into Gmail. It is clearly their, uh, one of their flagship products and they are they're continuing to invest in it. That can get confusing because it's Google, but uh, and they're constantly doing stuff. But that's one of those features that makes Google and the web app or Gmail and the web app useful, even though I don't use the web app. I use Spark, but I'm still accessing, right. you know, Gmail. Right. So um, the other tool, uh, other tools that we talked about. Edison Mail. Edison Mail is still going strong. And in fact, they are really leaning in on privacy, blocking tracking pixels and domain blocking. Do you know what a tracking pixel is, Nikki? Well, I can tell you what I think it is from like Facebook ads and things like that, mm -hmm. is that you'll be right. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so that, you know, you can figure out like they have this data i don't know where it comes from but they can tell you like when somebody has or actually this is email this isn't even facebook this is email where they can tell you mm -hmm. if they've opened up the email how long they were on the email if they never opened it up so it just gives you like the statistics of what's going on in the email Right. right, right. So for of, sales email, a lot yeah. of, yeah, that's exactly right. And a tracking pixel is generally a one by one pixel. It's literally a graphic, mm -hmm. like it's a little tiny, tiny, tiny graphic. Uh, and it's included and it has a specific unique file name. Uh, and it's included with the, with the, what's called the tracking code that includes links back to that file name. And when that image is loaded, the, the image itself lives on the remote server, right? On the sender's server. So when the sender's server gets a notice that you've opened your email and that pixel has been uh, launched, right? Has been downloaded. That's the signal that you've looked at this email mm -hmm. account mm -hmm. or this email that they sent you at this message. 
The degree to which you take action can then be tracked by the number of clicks you you make on any given thing. And all of that bundled together, all of that sort of metadata bundled together creates an image of your interaction with the company and your value to the company based on it, whether or not you're reading their email. If you never download those pixels that, and, and never open those emails, then eventually you may just get dropped from the list, especially because, you know, for smaller senders, if you're on a list and you don't look at the email, they co- it, it costs, costs them money. money to send you right. an email. Yeah. So eventually they'll purge their list of, of dead uh, addresses. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is the deal about Edison Mail. And in fact, the new version of Apple Mail built into Apple as of the last, I think, Monterey and now Ventura, uh, they tracking pixels are considered by privacy advocates as an invasion of privacy. Yeah. I don't have tracking pixels on on paper mail that I get from my mailbox, right? right? right. Nobody's watching me when I get mail. Why should that be any different in my email inbox? That's the that's the general case. And so they are looking at ways to uh, block the tracking pixel. Mm. So if somebody using Apple Mail, or in this case, Edison Mail, you can turn on this feature to block tracking pixels, and then it appears as if you never read the email. Right. It appears as if this sender sent you an email and you're a dead recipient. Right. right? You don't exist, which is, as you can imagine, damaging to email performance tracking, because then all you're looking at is, did this person click on the link? And if they didn't click on the link, you don't have any understanding of whether or not they read your email. And so this is causing a lot of turmoil. But for privacy advocates, and that's, you know, increasing more and more app- email applications are including this ability to block tracking pixels to help keep your email inbox clean. And Edison Mail is a tool that's really, really working hard to do that. So it has some of the best in class uh, ability to block by entire domain senders, by tracking pixels, all of that. That's really uh, what they're looking at. Another application that's doing that is Canary. Uh, that's another email that e- email um, that is uh, uh, application that is really focused on privacy. Um, we talked about AirMail. We- and we used, used AirMail for a, for a time, while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was an Apple Design Award winner from two, in 2017. I haven't seen a whole lot of change from the game. I opened it up and it still looks very much the same as mm-hmm. it did, you know, three, four years ago. And uh, so that's, you know, it can be a sign that they got it right. Mm-hmm. And it can also be a sign that they're struggling a little bit. I don't mm-hmm. know, but it's still out there and it's still working. Um, and we also talked about uh, the app Mailbird. Uh, And Mailbird is actually a really interesting one, especially in the context of our conversation about Spark. You know, we use Spark. Mm -hmm. Spark is a wonderful uh, app. It is and has been for a very long time Mac only. But they raced and raced and raced and now have in development in in their version three a Windows app. So now they're going to be cross platform. If you're on Windows, you can download a beta right now and start using Spark. We love Spark. Mailbird is the other way. It looks exactly like Spark, mm. right? It looks exactly, but it's been for Windows only for the longest time. Oh, I see. And now they are in development of a Mac version of Mailbird uh, that gives you many of the same features. And so uh, it's fun to watch that 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 race kind of right. head to head. So if you're a Windows user and you and you want to check out something akin to Spark that we're always talking about, then that is um, Mailbird is your is mm-hmm. your jam. So um, we also, in episode 444, Reclaiming Email, we talked about Hey.com. Uh, hey is uh, uh, tries to re- completely reinvent how you use email. Uh, they uh, It's all web-based. Uh, you have to move. You can't check other email through Hey. You really are forwarding your email into Hey, and it is interpreting your email and trying to apply AI and machine learning and all these things to detect just the important stuff and show you the important stuff and move everything else out of, hey, it is apparently extraordinarily good at triage. um, So you can see very easily and very clearly what is valuable to you. You can move things that are misclassified very quickly, but it's not um, app-based, it's web-based, and it's still in very active development. And so, um, you know, I... I never, it's such a big swing to move 15 years of Gmail into a new platform that I was not able to make the leap to do a permanent shift to hey. It's it's Mm -hmm. fine. And for some people, it's extraordinary. It's not for Mm -hmm. me. 
Um, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it, and I still haven't been able to wrap my head mm-hmm. around it. Uh, and don't forget, uh, we did do the annual purge, the email purge for patrons. Melissa ran this uh, a while ago, and it is in for members. It's in the Patreon. Oh, I feed, forgot so about that. We should do that, that again. Yeah. Melissa, if you're listening. Um, we did talk. <laughs> yeah. Let's, Let's do it do again. It again. Why again. Not? <laughs> um, we, we talked about Apple Mail. Uh, it is the default mail. It's interesting. It's Apple Mail is conservative. I don't want to call it slow to evolve, but conservative to evolve. But privacy is built in. I like Apple Mail. I know a lot of people in business that use by default Apple Mail. Apple Apple just offers Apple Mail, right? right? It's just that's it. You, it's Apple Mail or you go to a third party. That is in contrast to Windows. Microsoft offers Windows Mail which is a solid fine, like it's a fine little app, but it is really designed for Uncle Tim, mm-hmm. you know, Uncle Tim, he's he's checking his personal email every day. He likes to get his stock picks and his newsletters and he's mm-hmm. fine. And it, But the, the challenge for Microsoft is they also have Outlook. Right. And Outlook is uh, is massive yes. and they are investing so heavily in Outlook as a personal thing, too, that going to Outlook.com setting up your email address. It's free. You can upgrade to Outlook through uh, through Microsoft 365 and get a lot of great features. You can access your Outlook email in third-party email clients, not just Outlook. So you can get it in Spark or Mailbird or AirMail or Edison Mail, whatever you want. So you can, like, you can just do a lot more with Outlook. And I think it's made Windows Mail sort of, uh, you know, it, it's backseated Windows Mail. A well, because so if you it's, use Windows Mail, awesome. It's just interesting because I think of Outlook as a Windows, like that's Windows Mail's Outlook. Like I wouldn't yeah. even think of Windows Isn't Mail as a separate thing. I would just assume that that, that you were talking about Outlook. Yeah. yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, right. Well, and Outlook is so interesting because, and and I, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about Outlook shortly, but Outlook is so interesting because it is, uh, you know, Microsoft has changed a lot over the last five mm-hmm. years, uh, you know, with their with their, the new CEO, when Balmer got out of there, like they have become a software company again, mm-hmm. not a Windows company. And uh, that's really a treat to see because they're doing some great innovation. And I think they're smaller a mm-hmm. little bit. And they're they're really I mean, they're doing some really neat things that serve everyone, whether they're using Windows or Mac or whatever, like they're really doing a lot of wonderful things. And so I think giving them a little attention is not a bad thing. They need to figure out their Outlook versus Windows yes. Mail strategy for <laughs> sure, um, because it's a little yeah. confusing. And then just this morning, I get this email, uh, this uh, notice from um, Francesco D'Alessio, who just did a video on the latest announcements coming out of Zoomtopia, Zooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, service Zoom is coming out with collaboration features, including Zoom Mail. Oh, Zoom Mail. I have a hard time saying Zoom that mail. Like, with a straight <laughs> yeah. face. Like, what are what are we doing, Zoom? Yeah. What are we doing? Like, I, I wonder if they, like, they have because of the pandemic, they have ownership in a in a, a you know conferencing place in the uh, conferencing technology in the market that is, you know, uh, second to none. And, uh, you know, it feels like maybe they're losing the thread of the lead that they have in that space. Just be great in that space. I don't know why we're getting into all this other stuff. I have Zoom phone, which is their voice over IP service. And I use that just as my like the business yes. line. And I'm thinking about canceling yeah. it, honestly, because for me as a small business, I just don't right. use it. Um but uh, but it, I can see it being incredibly useful for larger teams to just say, OK, now you when you get in, you have your Zoom conference for video and you have a phone number, voice over IP phone number so people can call you and switch back and forth and leave you voicemail and stuff. And like, let's make those services incredible uh, rather than diving do into you, email, which people do you remember have Skype? resolved. I, think. I do. <laughs> Microsoft. Is that what it is? Yeah. Right? It just when you were talking Microsoft about Zoom, it reminds Skype. me of Skype. And it was like, it feels like Skype. And I'm sure it, people still use it. But it feels like that is the album, you know, to the CD. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> like, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I I totally do. And, and Skype, like, it, it's so funny because Skype still has awesome collaboration and uh, features. I don't know, like you can get Skype phone numbers. Mm -hmm. You can still all do this. It's now Microsoft Skype and you can get through it in your browser. Like what happened that Skype totally lost the lost the thread to it? Because, you know, it's the same thing that a challenge that Google has with their multiple 
like options for video calls, right? Like you can do all kinds of different video calls and chats Mm -hmm. with Google tools uh, and they're trying to consolidate. Well, is is like what is Microsoft's strategy for that? Is it Skype? Is should it still be branded as Skype? I I don't I don't honestly know because I, you know, we we switched from Microsoft over to Google Docs and because Google had the most robust collaboration features Mm -hmm. at the time. I think Microsoft 365 has largely closed that gap and very few businesses uh, that didn't leave Microsoft are going back because they don't know. Right. right? They don't they made the transition and these transitions are so yeah, hard. Yeah. So, um, hmm. you know, Microsoft is is super relevant, super resonant. Their tools are great. They work well. They work across platform. And, um, and so I'm curious why, you know, what's going mm-hmm. on with Skype? Everybody I know, and for us, Skype was the de facto standard for podcast recording. And then it just was Exactly. It just, it just like stopped. stopped. Right. And because our guests stopped using yeah. it, like we used to have it because every one of our guests used to have a Skype mm-hmm. account and we could just give them the Skype ID and they would mm-hmm. know how to join mm-hmm. a meeting. And then they stopped mm-hmm. doing it. And like they were Zoom like, oh, I, I don't was, have Skype anymore. Was it? And then it was yeah. Zoom. Yeah. Then wow. it was Zoom. So anyhow. All right. So that is Zoom. So that's our little update on email. Uh, if you haven't listened to the entire episode last week, go for it. And now we go into <laughs> workplace tech. Episode oh, my God. 178. That had to have been like, what, 2014, maybe? Um, yeah, seriously. It had to have been a long time or, or ago. Or 13, probably. Yeah. 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 yeah 2000. So um, we reviewed. This was so interesting to me that uh, these things. So I'm, I have sort of consolidated. We'll do it really okay. quick and then I'll I'll talk about some things that have changed. So this is 178, 255 and 168. Three episodes around tech related to the <laughs> workplace, getting organized, staying organized. Uh let's see what happens. Calm. Calm app. It's a mindfulness app for Still meditations. Great. You using Still it? Great. Still yep. great. I think awesome. it's great. Uh Outlook, we talked about Already? Outlook yep. uh, by Microsoft. Yep, we 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 like it and respect yes. it. It is a it is a solid Which contributor. Everybody um, that knows Pete Wright knows that that's kind of that's a huge compliment, Microsoft, that you're getting this yeah. from Pete Wright, who is a like born Mac person, so <laughs> Apple person all over you. Uh, so that's a big compliment, and I I respect hey, you. Player recognizes for, game, yeah, right? Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> game recognizes yeah. game. Uh, I still three. use it. Absolutely, I still recommend every day. It. Yep. Uh, OmniFocus. That was me. Yes. I, and you know, it's interesting about OmniFocus, and I know you probably have something to say because I used it too. Because yeah. I used that was the very mm-hmm. first task manager I've ever used. Um, right. But I do have a couple of clients, current clients right now, that use OmniFocus, and um, and it it it's workable. It is workable. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I love OmniFocus. Mm-hmm. I love, I lo- have a deep, unironic love for this app. Um, and I wish that my context were a little bit different mm-hmm. because OmniFocus has an ideology. The OmniFocus team has an ideology that OmniFocus is a single user platform for professionals. And there is no collaboration. And as far as I understand it from their roadmap, there is no plan to incorporate collaboration between other mm. people. And that is the single reason that I stopped using OmniFocus because I started working with a team right. and we needed something that we could work on together. And I I am of the ideology, like my worldview is, I can't have multiple task managers. Right. I will not use one of them. Oh, absolutely. Right? If I have two, absolutely. I will not use one. Yes. It just will yeah. get dropped. So uh, so I had to drop OmniFocus and we'll talk about where I landed. I yep. think that's uh, the secret's out. Uh, <laughs> rescue Time and Time Sync. Uh, I don't remember Rescue Time these. and Time Sync. Rescue Time is an interesting app. It allows you to see, you connect your schedule and it allows you to see the holes in your schedule and figure out how to better plan and strategize your time oh. uh, so that you can find the holes to do is work. Is it still something right? you recommend? It, like, is that something? It's still, I will say it still exists, but it really is a way to automate time blocking. And I I have adapted to not using a tool to time block. Because you can just do it and so like yourself. You just yeah. do it. Like I don't need a service and I don't need another paid service to do it. Time Sync allows you to see where you're spending your time. And I have an app called Timing 
running on my Mac to allow me to do that. It just says, what apps are you using? Where is your time going right now? And at the end of the day, you can look at a report and see how, you know, where your what apps you spent the most time in. If you spend all your time on certain websites uh, that are not related to your job, you can see, oh, I lost track of time there. And I was looking at coffee makers and, for <laughs> three hours today. Like you can get Even a sense you of, know you kind can't of what's buy one. going on. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. Uh, so that's time sync. Uh, the but again, the app I use is timing, and uh, it's not a thing I give a whole lot of attention to. But when I feel like I'm in trouble, like I feel like I'm losing time or not being as productive as I want to be, then I I turn on timing. So timing and, and, and time sync done. are basically the same thing. It's just whatever you resonate with. Like yeah. if you look at the app and you yeah, want and to if do you're this, a, like what 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 do you like? Like what? Uh, yeah, right? pretty yeah, much. I thing. I think. Um, Yes. And I think uh, the uh, the the thing about time sync is, you know, both of these are are pretty Mac focused. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're I, I don't I think timing has a web interface. I don't believe it works for Windows at all. OK, so I, I don't have I think this was a phase and we all go through yes. phases and that's OK. Um, so. All right. Um, in 255, we updated a couple, we added a couple more apps to this list. I added Alto's Adventure, which is a game. It's not a tool at all, <laughs> but I still love it. And Alto is still an awesome, uh, to, uh, an awesome thing for just, you know, playing while I'm waiting in line for stuff or, you know, sitting in a, in a concert waiting for it to start. You know, I've gone to a few things. I've gone out and I'm sitting in the thing and I'm alone. I'm waiting for my kid's choir concert to start. And I'm like, I'll play alto. You know, I still do That's it. I, I love it. It's been years and I still do it. Hazel and File Juggler. Hazel for Mac, File Juggler for Windows. These tools are amazing. And I still use Hazel on my Mac nonstop. It's always running. All it does is act on files based on a set of rules. For example, the one I that is always running every day. When I record a podcast, I name the file in Audio Hijack, which we'll talk about in a minute. I name that file with uh, the name of the show, like in this case, ADHD, and then space, and then the name of the you know episode or number of the episode. When I hit stop, those files that are recorded get saved into my Pete audio folder. Hazel is watching the Pete audio folder mm -hmm. and it takes that audio and moves it into the ADHD inbox for audio, which is the which is where you and I share a Dropbox. So I know when I go to the ADHD file, it's that audio is always there. Like for you and me, both of us, all of our audio is there. And it's all because Hazel is watching for the keyword ADHD in that folder. Hazel can do so much more, though. Hazel can rename files if you want to organize your files. It can you can look at OCR in like, say, you get a bill that's from um, from Northwest Natural and you say, OK, Hazel. I want you to read the the text of this PDF that is saved in this folder. And if you see the, the Northwest Natural in the PDF, I want you to rename the file, find the date in the file, add that to the file name and put it in my my folder system for to pay the bill. So you can have it take many, many actions on individual files in your file system. It can like it, it can get a little bit out of control. So I don't recommend you add 100 rules on any given day. But boy, for stuff that you just need to automate without thinking about it, it's super easy. And if you have a computer that's always on, like if your computer is at work and it goes to sleep, but is is running in the background, the Mac, you know, has a, a system state where it's sleeping, but will turn on in the background just to run automations, mm -hmm. uh, very low power mode. Um, Hazel will run in that cycle and it will take action on stuff that happens when you're away. So if you uh, if you're on your phone and you get a download of a PDF, you put it in in a folder in your Dropbox file system. Hazel's watching that at home. So as soon as that file syncs in your Dropbox system, it will take action on it. And when you get back to your desk, it's been renamed and moved and all of that. So it's wow. incredibly useful and powerful. I'm a huge fan of these kinds of apps, Hazel and File Juggler. So still a big fan. Um, Lumosity is a brain training uh, one of the one of the many brain training things, right? To keep your brain agile, it sends you games and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But I did an episode of What's That Smell where we talked about the value of keeping your brain and your memory sharp as you age. 
And the best advice that that we found from a doctor was like, you know, Sudoku, brain training apps, crosswords, they're all great. I mean, they're fine. But the best thing you can do to really flex your brain as a muscle is to take a position that you feel strongly about and argue the opposite side of that position. Really try to authentically find the opposite side of that position. You're going to rewire, you're going to help rewire your brain for flexibility by doing that. And it is a multidimensional argument when you try to to convince yourself that you agree with the other right. side. Oh, and that's really interesting. I thought that was really interesting. I wanted to make sure that was that was positioned here because that is better than any crossword you yeah, will ever do, do wow. to keep your brain wow. flexible. Thought that was great. Good um, to know. Pencil by 53. Pencil's been around for a long time. When the first iPad came out, there was Pencil, this app by 53. Uh, and you had you could buy a giant stylus that was the pencil with a soft tip and you could draw on it. And it was not not terribly useful for <laughs> taking notes because you were like drawing with a right, piece of charcoal. Right. You know, it felt very big. It wasn't very, very fine tuned. Uh, it is a still a wonderful kind of sketchbook. Uh, it has been changed uh, and it was purchased by uh, uh, WeTransfer back in 2018. It is now separate apps. They've, they've got paper and paste for different uh, functions within the original uh, Pencil app. Um, and still great. But boy, when the Apple Pencil came out for the iPad, that all but but changed that market. And now the Apple Pencil in those apps is extraordinary mm -hmm. and just so, so much better. And so we'll talk again about that, uh, about the Apple Pencil. Mm. Uh, and of course, episode 168, dealing with kid work, uh, we talked about Evernote. Um, and I think maybe we should talk just briefly about Evernote now. I would like What is to. your position on Evernote? I am struggling. And, I, you know, I'm glad that we're bringing this up because I have used Evernote ever since... I don't, you know, Pete tells me what to do and I do it. That's how it goes, people. Yeah. Like, Pete, I trust you with all of my technology. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, we were, we used Evernote, uh, gosh, a long time ago, just even for our podcast notes. Remember that? That was a long time ago. Yeah. And so it's one yeah. of those things that I use. I'm trying to use Evernote as a online filing cabinet. If I am doing research on something or I want to save articles on a particular topic or even like I'm going to the conference, I'm going to the ADHD conference, any conference that I attend, I usually use um, Evernote to take my notes. And but this is where I struggle. I don't really I mean, I like Evernote. It works. It's functional. Um, I'm a little bored of Evernote because I've used it for so long that it'd be, it would almost be kind of nice to have something new. I'm not really like sold on the way that I have the organizational hierarchy. I never really go back to it for anything. And so, um, yeah, I'm a little mixed. It's like, I have it, I'm using it, but I, I don't know if I want to keep it. Well, and I, I imagine it's because so much of the collaboration stuff is gone. You're not collaborating in Evernote with anybody no, else, it's really, right? I really am just using it to collect data and to like, and yeah. the only note taking <clears throat> that I use is, is at conferences. Like if you and I are having a meeting, I, I will write notes on a piece of paper and then I put that whatever tasks are on that piece of paper yeah. into things. In things. So I'm yeah, doing that right. handwritten. I'm not doing it. So I don't know. I'm stoked. Well, I have I have a couple of thoughts. I I think Evernote went through a very dark period and they lost their CEO and they had some real trouble with application bloat and all of their different, you know, uh, apps for different platforms were built on a different code base and it was very, very hard to maintain. So you had Evernote for Windows and Evernote for Mac were completely different apps. And, you know, you'd get one feature here and then six months later, you'd get that same feature on the other platform. It was just awful. It doesn't it sync real well with your devices. No. Like that's something else I noticed that is a big old pain. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I'd be interested to know, like, if you were really to sit down and look at is Evernote the tool that is that is failing you? Or is it the fact that you haven't invested any time in the updated, like what Evernote expects of you as a user? Would that give it new it life might. for you? Because, Evernote, because see, I looked yeah. at and this is just this is just 
our opinions, right? I, I think all of these things can work for people in different ways. I looked at Obsidian, I think. Yeah. And when I looked at that, I thought, okay, that's, that isn't going to work for me because it's, it's, um, the way it felt so database-based. Like it felt like just a. No, I, it's really I I would I would say it's definitely not for you yeah. because it's a markdown editor. It is a that's, markdown okay, editor. If you don't is. know what markdown yeah. is, then it's not yeah. for you for yeah. sure. And I would never in a bazillion years have recommended Obsidian okay. for you. That's knowing good to your know. Use case. Not a bazillion that's years. Really good to know. I would recommend an app like Craft. Mm. Craft is a is a fantastic app. Along the lines of uh, Notion, I just I like Notion. I think Craft is prettier. If you've heard of yes. Notion, Notion is another app for this kind of thing. Um, and uh, I just think the development path uh, at, at Craft is and the design around which they they give their app. I think it's just prettier, and it's a native app experience. So you have an app. It's not it's not like a web page in a mm -hmm. shell that looks like a native app. It's a native app. And, and that's important for a lot of Mac users. It's important for me. I want a native app on whatever platform I'm using. I liked I like Craft a lot, and it it does allow you business level collaboration. So you can set up a team and have people using it together. Um, it's uh, it also allows things like tables and and kind of database structure for things if you want mm -hmm. them. Some of the stuff we're doing in Coda, which is web based, you can do in mm -hmm. Craft. Um, but I think uh, generally Craft is a thing that I, that might be worth looking at. I think moving out of Evernote is hard. It is. They, they try to say it's easy, but it's, it's hard. hard. And I think it's possible that a, um, you know, you'd have to have the same kind of consideration about the value of your archive in Evernote, um, you know, to, to really consider what is the value for moving. I've moved out of Evernote and I can tell you 90 percent of the notes that I moved out of Evernote, I have not looked at even though I have them all right. parsed and cleaned up and living in a new location. And so um, I, I can't. I can't say with 100% like great authority, yes, you should definitely move from Evernote. It might be great for you. Uh, if you look at what Evernote is now, mm -hmm. which is different mm -hmm. than it was, if you're using it the same way you've always used it, it might be worth just, you know, watching some of their newer mm -hmm. videos and looking at what would it look like if you started using more, you know, uh, of their calendaring and task management and and integrating notes like your meeting notes with your calendar app and and things like that like all of that can be in Evernote they're do, putting some great attention they have a new CEO all of their application rewrites are done um, so yeah is it time to give Evernote a new shot I mean I'm not doing it personally I'm happy right. where I am but Evernote it still exists yeah. it's still yeah. out there um, and they're still they're still kicking I I'll, I'll put a link for Craft in. Uh, in, in the show notes because it's um, it's it, it is a really beautiful new rapidly developed app um, for note taking and and document management. The other thing I like about both Craft and Notion and you know Coda and uh, even Obsidian is you can use it as a publishing platform. So if you have a document inside of this thing that you uh, that you want to share with the world, you can just type it up, type up an FAQ and hit publish and it, it becomes its own public web web page. Mm. And what you'll see with like Notion and Craft, like their help system, like their like search for support, mm -hmm. it's all based on their own tool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you're navigating a, a public web page that was published in one of those right. tools. I think that's really yeah. cool. And it gives me lots of ideas for ways I want to use this sort of publishing platform for, you know, for giving information to our own mm -hmm. audiences. I think it's really useful. Uh, okay. That's uh, Evernote. Oh, my gosh. This list is so long. I don't know how we're going to do this. Okay. <laughs> it really is. So we've talked about uh, Calm and Outlook and things at OmniFocus and TimeSync. We've done all that. Uh, we, I can't believe it. We didn't talk about Text Expander in the in the uh, episode 276 where we talked about text automation and ADHD. I did so much research around all these other apps, Phrase Expander, Phrase Express, Brevi, A Text, Typeinator, and Type It For Me, that I didn't actually include the only app that was installed on my system at oh, the time, so which was Text Expander. I why. What am I thinking? I don't know. I have, but I, I guess I, I write it off to the fact that it's an invisible tool. It is a tool that just sits in the background and is constantly running and working. And it's so in my fingers that I don't think mm -hmm. about it. And when it comes to recommending, like, how can you automate text? It occurred to me just to sit down and do the research. 
and not to look at what I was doing at the time. That's just, I call that growth. Yes. And so now I can tell you uh, with authority, Text Expander is great. It's now for all platforms. It's not just a Mac. It is a service. And uh, I still, as you, uh, I hope, know, I am a big believer in Text Expander. They are a, a sponsor of this show. And uh, I I love I love it it's so dear. I do. Now, does that mean Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't want to interrupt you. Talk no, because no, no. I go know ahead. you are so passionate about Text Expander. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to make sure we don't forget about Fantastical because I've been hearing a lot of really good things about that. Yeah, Fantastical is an is an app that a lot of people are are using as their calendar if they're not using the default app, uh, a Mac app calendar. Uh, it is a, a Mac application. Um it allows you to originally it was just a replacement of your calendar and you it would sync with your default like Apple Calendar uh, or iCal back in the early, mm-hmm. early days. Uh, and it would just kind of show you in a, a little bit prettier interface uh, what's going on. Now it is a complete system. It's a subscription service and it does everything. The stuff I love about it, uh, it now integrates scheduling. So you can say, hey, we need to have a meeting. Let's have that meeting and include a Zoom link. And the Zoom link needs to have the cameras on and participation and password. And is there a waiting room? No, okay. And so you do all that and it atta- it builds the Zoom link and attaches it based on your account. Uh, it integrates with, te- with Todoist, which is my uh, work mm-hmm. management system. So I can see all of my work in my calendar. It, um, it also has... Uh, scheduling um, openings. So I can say, hey, we need to have a meeting together. Here are four openings in the next week that work for me. Pick one and that will be locked in on my calendar and the rest will go away. Or here's my published calendar. It, it essentially is Calendly. Mm-hmm. I was able to delete my Calendly account because that's built in to Fantastical now. And with just a, I, I spent 15 minutes creating my meeting templates, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, et cetera. And then I can just send links. I have those links now, ironically, in Text Expander. And I just, you know, hit my snippet for Text Expander and it puts links in emails and signatures and anywhere I need them to be. So Fantastical is a complete, complete meeting, like management system. I, love it and have used it for mm-hmm. years. It also now comes bundled with Card Hop, which is a relationship-based uh, alternative to contacts. It uses your contacts database oh, right. uh, and then shows you like the, it, it's just a really fast access to people. Oh, interesting. Uh, and, you know, it shows you birthdays and all that stuff. But it also says like you can start adding relationships very easily, like, um, you know, assistants and vice presidents, bosses, uh, you know, aunts, uncles, relationships. And then you can view them in kind of a family mm-hmm. tree organization. Mm-hmm. So you can see how people are related in an organization or family. Mm. I like it a lot. They're doing some great work on it. So Flexibits uh, for looking at fantastic and card hop. Uh, Great, great apps. Launchers. Uh, If you're familiar with um, uh, Spotlight on the Mac, if you hit, uh, I think the default is command space, it opens a little box right in the middle of your screen where you can start typing stuff and it gives you essentially search results. Whether it's a local app on your computer or searching the web, it gives you search results right in in there. And it's, it's great. There are alternatives to that. There are four that we have talked about in the past and that I am using regularly. One, one of them, sometimes two of them, Alfred, Raycast, LaunchBar, and Keepirina. Mm. Keepirina is Windows. The other two are Mac. And I don't know why, y'all. I don't know why, but this is one of those things that um, I just was not able to find a lot of alternatives that are similar to what we're doing with like Raycast and Alfred on, on the Mac. I It just... Uh, there wasn't a huge number of those alternatives. You should check out Keeperina uh, for this kind of thing mm-hmm. if you're looking at it. For Alfred, I can hit, I've replaced the keyboard shortcut. I hit command space. I can launch apps. I can type any, the, just the first couple of, of letters of any app and hit return and it launches the app. I can take actions. I can have, I can select a file on my desktop desktop and, and trigger Alfred and move that file somewhere else with just a few keystrokes. So uh, I can trigger workflows. So if there's something I need to do, like schedule a task that creates a meeting, I can create a custom workflow and trigger it with just a few keystrokes 
on my Mac. That's all stuff you can do with Alfred and Raycast and LaunchBar. Incredibly, incredibly powerful and useful tools that are always just, again, they're it's hard to use a new Mac that doesn't have those for me because they're so ingrained as part of the operating right. system. Um, I love them so much. Um, uh, uh, notes, we've talked about Obsidian. I am a Markdown user, heavy Markdown user, and I love Obsidian for that. I also love Connected Notes. It's a wiki style uh, system, so I can create one note for the ADHD podcast and have a list of all of the episodes we've done. And when I click on that, it goes to a new note that has all the notes that we put into the episode, all my research and stuff. It's all connected. I love Obsidian. I use DevonThink as my PDF library. So that was part of Evernote that where I just dump all the PDFs in and it and and then I'm able to search PDF. I think Devon Think is a a it's more expensive, but it is a research tool and it is great with mm-hmm. PDFs. Um, but really, you know, we talked a, a little bit about the Apple Pencil and the iPad. When the iPad came out and the Apple Pencil came out, everything changed for my note taking because now I was able to do the handwriting stuff, but do it in a way that was legible to right. me and storable in the cloud. So the two apps that we use heavily and recommend are Notability and GoodNotes. The real standout feature of Notability that is extraordinary is connected audio notes where you can pl- record using the built-in microphone while you're taking notes and go back and scrub through the audio to specific points in your notes so you can say you're say you're the speaker is talking or the the teacher is is lecturing and you're drawing a uh, you know, an image or something, and it's uh, at that time that relates to it, you can jump back to exactly what the teacher was saying at the time you were sketching that slide or whatever you were doing. Um, incredibly useful. Also integrates with your camera, so you can hold up your iPad, take a quick picture of a slide, drop that slide right into your notes. Uh, it's incredibly powerful, and people are doing some extraordinary things. Students are doing extraordinary things in keeping their notes engaging and fun and uh, and uh, accurate. That's great. As a result of all these features. Yeah, really useful. I, I just can't stress how important the Apple Pencil is to my workflow because, you know, I don't, I largely don't use pen and paper anymore. If I need to write something down, it's with the Apple Pencil on the screen of my iPad. And it is, for me, it is that, it, it triggers that part of my brain that is the same thing that you get when mm-hmm. writing on mm-hmm. paper. Um, I like it a lot. Uh, also, can't underscore the value for my work of my Apple Watch. Having this on my wrist is incredibly important because I can just lift my watch to my mouth and start talking to save myself voice memos and reminders and create new tasks and create new appointments and schedules. And uh, when I'm driving in the car and need to do that, that's super useful. I can also say, hey, uh, lady, send Nikki a voice message and I can actually record a voice message of, of my voice and have it sent to you uh, via messages. And I'm that's sure really useful. I actually only... You saying, hey, lady. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, lady. Uh, it, I actually just learned I could do that. I knew that we could use um, text. You could do send text messages where it dictates... Right. But you could actually say send a voicemail to and it sends your voice, an audio recording of your voice, which I think is so cool. Um, Super useful. Okay, last thing. And then I swear I'm shutting up because this has been way too long. I want to do a round or just a rapid fire because I'm I'm often asked, like, what is the stuff that I'm using to do my job, like constantly running? And so I'm going to do this really, really quickly for the professional stuff, producing podcasts uh, and capturing audio. I edit everything in Logic Pro Studio. I tried Adobe. I can't wrap my head around Audition. It's uh, very powerful. Also, it's the worst. It doesn't work the way my brain does. Uh, Final Cut. I'm a Final Cut guy. When everybody jumped to Premiere, I stayed on Final Cut because I love it so much. I would love to, when I was a boy, I would sleep with the manual. It would make me, it would keep me comfortable. Of course it would. (laughs) Um, Rogue, Rogue Amoeba Software is an incredible software company that makes just stuff for capturing audio. Audio Hijack is what we use. Uh, both Nikki and I are using Audio Hijack right now to record our microphones for this podcast. Loopback is a virtual audio device, so I can create audio devices out of magic by routing 
sound from one application to another application and into this call and take this call and record it in a different place. Like it is just an amazing uh, tool that is incredibly difficult to explain. But if you're a hardcore audio head and you want to do more with audio on your Mac, check out Rogue Amoeba software. The camera I'm using right now is the Opal C1 4K webcam. It is still, as far as I know, available for waiting list purchase. Uh, I guess the pandemic hurt their development, but it is a great webcam. It is uh, the alternative camera that I used to use was the Logitech Brio Ultra HD, which I also love. Uh, Having a 4K camera on uh, webcam is uh, great. Even though most services only use HD, I just think the quality and the lighting and uh, uh, everything is is better. so if you spend a lot of time on video, upgrading your camera, putting some bucks into a camera is is useful. Now, in my menu bar across the top, my sort of Mac system tray, <laughs> Fantastical with next appointment, card hop, clean shot for capturing screenshots and quick video uh, screen screen. Uh, captures. Magnet is a window manager that I use to sling windows around uh, with keyboard shortcuts. So like control option right arrow takes the current window I'm looking at and automatically resizes it to the right half of my screen. And control option left arrow will take another app and, and sling it over to the left side of my screen so I can organize my windows. It has a bazillion keyboard shortcuts so you can put windows in top five sixths of your screen. Like it's crazy. I love Magnet. Uh, Express VPN for testing and making sure that I can deliver files around the world. Uh, Dropbox is running. SoundSource is another rogue amoeba. Superior sound control for the Mac. It essentially replaces the volume icon in the menu bar and allows me to do all kinds of crazy stuff with with audio. Um, Bartender. I have a lot more apps on my um, menu bar, but I use Bartender because Bartender will hide the apps that I want running in the background, but I don't want to look at all the time. Like Alfred. We talked about Alfred, my... Uh, command space Mm -hmm. uh, shortcut thing. Uh, Pastebot, the clipboard manager that I use. So when you do things like command C to copy something, if I copy a URL with a certain, you know, www dot whatever, I can have Pastebot see that, replace it so that when I hit command V, it places a new URL pattern in there. So you can do things, automate things with your copy and paste with a tool like Pastebot. I love it. Uh, Hazel, we talked about Rocket. You know how in like uh, Discord and Slack, if you hit colon and then start typing, it'll give you an emoji right. picker. Right. So Rocket gives me that everywhere in my system. Oh. So I can be writing an email and hit colon, man, face palm, and it shows it'll allow me to insert the face palming emoji, which is it also gives me statistics on which emoji I use the most. <laughs> and it turns out that's the one. And second is shrug. <laughs> so uh, Backblaze for backing up. Clean My Mac is a service I use for mostly for uninstalling apps completely to make sure all the little little files get taken away that sometimes get missed. Uh, Set App is a service, a subscription service for little apps, which is great. So things like... Um, CleanShot X is a set app app. So I pay one subscription fee to set app and then I can download any of the apps that are that are listed in set up. It's super useful. I have a script menu, text expander, Adobe Creative Cloud, uh, Todoist, 1Password. We didn't even talk about 1Password or today, Todoist, but love 1Password. Yeah. Ray, I know, or Todoist, uh, Raycast, uh, Stage Manager, and Parcel, which is a, a package tracking app that gives me notifications when packages are moving their way across the country. That's it. Oh my God, that was so long. So long. I'm so sorry. Uh, but lots of apps and I will put links to everything that I have dropped in this episode. Oh my God, this is going to take forever uh, to build these show notes in the yes. show notes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Melissa, for doing all Great the pre-work. Stuff. And thank you everybody for sitting through this. I hope there are some recommendations in here that are useful to to one person. Let's just if it's useful for one I'm person, sure I will call this a win. Be useful for one person. The only thing I have to say is don't try everything at once. <laughs> Please don't try everything. That would the, be a mistake. The, this is but consider years this, of you like yeah. figuring this out. So yeah. Oh my god, totally. Yeah. Well, next week we're going to move into home health 
and um, and fitness. And that will be shorter because I'm not very fit. But I do have some recommendations. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you, Pete. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. Thank you for your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to the conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in the Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Thank you.